So our next two talks are going to be pretty quick. So to get us started with our first lightning talk of the day, it's Dan Giovanelli from Google um, to talk about juggling chainsaws. Hey. Um, so robot is a tough act to follow, but I'll see what I can do. Um, someone had to. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dan. I work at Google in New York as a software engineer in tools and infrastructure. Um, talk is called Juggling Chainsaws for Fun and Profit. And I'm here to tell you about some of the mistakes my team made uh, building cross-platform mobile test systems. Um, so like I said, my name is Dan Giovanelli. Um, I primarily work on mobile. Um, and my experience is specifically in iOS. Um, on a team called the Mobile Display Ads Testing Infrastructure Team, which from the name you might guess means we build testing infrastructure for mobile display ads. A uh, little more specifically, uh, our customers are other engineers who are working on a whole bunch of different ad products, uh, display ad products specifically, uh, all serving to mobile devices. So as a rule, if it has a screen and no keyboard, that's us. Uh, phone, tablet, watch, all that kind of stuff. Um, this basically means we have to build testing infrastructure for a bunch of different ad products serving through several different native SDKs on both Android and iOS. So when our team first got started about two years ago, uh, we were sort of facing this really thorny problem, which is we had these engineers building very, very complicated backend stacks uh, with a lot of different moving parts. And they needed to be able to test their changes to those stacks on mobile and make sure that they weren't breaking anything on mobile devices. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't mobile devs. Uh, they were usually back-end devs, so Java, C++. Um, they're not mobile experts, and they don't really have the time or bandwidth to become mobile experts. That uh, was our job. Um, and we had to avoid getting caught up in what we call the matrix, which uh, Jurgen talked about a little bit in the keynote, which is basically this idea that you have multiple operating systems, multiple SDK versions, multiple device types, and you have sort of this combinatoric explosion of things you have to test that gets really out of hand really, really quickly. So what was our plan? Uh, we decided pretty early on that we were going to let our users write tests in this sort of non-mobile domain-specific language. Uh, looked a lot like JSON. Um, and you can see an example of one of those tests up there. Uh, basically, they're data-driven tests. They lay out the most important parts of a test, what ad to load, what sizes to load it on, what to do with that ad. Um, and then we, under the hood, uh, ran those on mobile. We basically had our own pipeline to uh, convert those to something that worked on mobile and run them so our customers didn't have to worry about that. Uh, we decided also pretty early on to run on simulator. Uh, just that makes the whole matrix thing a lot easier to deal with because you don't have to worry about having all these different devices. And devices are hard. Uh, they crash, they break, they catch on fire sometimes. That actually happened once. Um, so we figured simulators was sort of the easier way to go. Uh, we wanted to make our results just really easy to understand and have clear action. So rather than saying, something is broken, make it more, this is broken, this is how you should fix it. And a sort of a a parallel request, um, our customers wanted a manual testing app. So basically an app that they could just in front of them as part of their development cycle, load up an ad, interact with it, see what happens in addition to the automated framework. So how do we actually build this thing? Uh, like I said, we had custom Python scripts to take those DSL tests and both what we refer to as unfolding them, which was taking one test and turning it into a bunch of tests across operating systems and all that, um, and converted into intermediate formats that played nicely on mobile. So JSON for Android and for iOS, a format called plist, which is a binary XML format that Apple and Apple alone uses. Surprise, surprise. Um, we had custom Android and iOS apps that allowed for manual testing. Like I said before, the apps that could open an ad and run through them. And then those same apps were basically driven by those tests uh, for automation testing. Uh, those ran on simulator, and they were driven by Espresso on Android and an internal iOS uh, functional testing framework for iOS. 
Uh, we had an app engine backend that we used for uh, storing golden images. So for testing rendering, you could compare an ad to a known good image. And it also stored some additional data for tests. Um, we had internal Google systems for actually spinning up the simulators and interacting with them and getting data from them. Uh, but there was really nothing there that you couldn't build at home from open source parts. Uh, we just were lazy um, and used some pre-existing stuff for it. Internal pre-existing stuff, not open source pre-existing stuff. Uh, and we integrated with the existing Google tooling for building binaries and running tests. Uh, so basically, we could integrate very nicely into our users' development workflow. The same systems that they were used to for running unit tests and integration tests, they could just kick off these tests and get results back the way they were used to. Um, there's a little bit of a diagram there that I won't spend too much time on. Uh, but basically, the stuff that's in the clouds is existing Google infrastructure. So we were able to uh, kick off our system from that and then sort of hook back into it. Um, so the braggy part, what went right? Um, we put a lot of thought into how to avoid the matrix, and it pretty much worked. Between running on simulator and using that domain-specific language, um, we, our team, had to worry about the matrix a lot, all the time. But it was completely opaque to our users. Uh, they did not have to care about how they were going to run across all these different devices, which was a major goal of ours. Um, and on a similar note, the, our back-end developer customers really appreciated that they didn't have to know anything about mobile. They could write these JSONy tests, kick them off from the systems they knew, get back results in the systems they knew. And they really liked that. And it was just it was a useful system. We had great adoption for both the manual and the automation components. Um, we had a lot of metrics, and they said nice things. Um, so now the fun part. Uh, what do we mess up? We thought a lot about these back-end developers who are going to be using our system. What we didn't think about was that the developers who were also working, who were actually working on the native SDKs that we were building into our apps, would also want these kinds of tests. And they wound up using the system too, but they wanted less abstraction. They wanted to be able to write tests natively, and they wanted to be able to kick them off from their IDEs. And unfortunately, because of how our system was architected, we couldn't really give them that. Um, we couldn't integrate it with their development cycle, the native development cycle. And that became more of a problem as time went on. Uh, we also had a whole bunch of systems which should have been really lightweight um, that were sort of stuck together because uh, as we were developing, we had you know the manual versus the automation. We had all these different SDKs, and we sort of kept stapling them onto the system until it became this kind of Franken system where whenever one thing broke, totally unrelated things would also break because they were closely tethered, and that caused unnecessary flakiness. Uh, we also didn't think through platform differences. We sort of thought from the beginning that we'd build things for Android, we'd build things for iOS, we'd provide them both. Uh, it didn't really work like that because they're very different platforms. Um, and we wound up with things that were a little harder to implement on one platform or things that were completely impossible to implement on another platform. And that sort of led to this problem where we had uh, inconsistent feature sets. And you had tests that could only run on Android or only run on iOS. and that. Uh, added cognitive load for our users who now have to worry about where their tests could run, which defeat, sort of defeated the purpose of part of the entire system. So what do I wish I'd known from the get-go? Uh, what do we learn from this? Subdivide your systems. It's really easy to think, oh, I'm building something that's sort of built on top of something else, so I'll just put it in there. And that gets you velocity in the short term, but it causes all sorts of problems in the long term. Um, if you think two things should be in different code bases, you're probably right. Um, ideally, you know, you want to have sort of logically divided systems sharing common infrastructure. Um, if any of you are thinking microservices, that's, yeah. Um, the whole idea of the God object anti-pattern from object-oriented programming, where you have one object that does everything and nothing, um, that applies to systems, too. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's generally just good software engineering practice, but it is important to keep in mind, um, you know. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, know who your customers are and have a plan to give them what they want. And notice that I did not say know who you think you cu your customers are and what you think they want, because you will be wrong. Uh, take some time to go out there, talk to people who might be using your systems, get a sense of who they are and how to build what they want. And the answer may be there are going to be people who want to use a given system where it's really not the right fit. 
And that's a great thing to know at the beginning, because you can say, this is not the system for you. We'll build you something next, rather than them trying to use it and not being able to do what they want and getting frustrated. Don't ignore platform details uh, for any given feature. Have at least a pretty clear idea of how you're going to implement it on whatever platforms you're using. And if it's going to be much harder on one than the other, have an idea of how to mitigate that. Um, maybe that means putting more development resources behind the harder one, or delaying release of one even after it's finished until the other is finished. Just have some idea of how you're going to address the fact that the platforms are different. Uh, simulators are great in automation. Um, they let you do all sorts of great stuff with sharding and parallelism. Uh, you don't have to worry about them catching on fire. Um, you're always going to need some amount of real device testing. There are bugs that will only pop up on real devices. Um, there are features that you can only test on real devices, um, so things like NFC or camera. Um, but save that for manual testing. Uh, anything that you can run on simulator for automation, you should run on simulator in our experience. Uh, so that's it. i um, got four minutes left. So if there are any questions, I'll take those. Can we switch to top view? It's failing. Uh, iOS automation is painful for everyone. Are you guys going to open source any of these internal tools? Uh, so some of them already have been open sourced. Um, there's a great tool called Martian uh, that we use for um, proxying requests for verifying network traffic and mocking out network responses. Um, the people who built that and open sourced it are actually here at GTAC. Uh, so if you see Brahma Ghosh, say hi. Um, some of the tools we want to open source um, but can't for various reasons, and some we want to open source, but it's a slow process. And it's in process, but when that'll happen, uh, there are a lot of variables as to when they'll come out. So what simulator and test tool set do you use to avoid a big lab of matrix of device OS browser combos? Um, so for the simulator, uh, we're just using, like I said, it's mostly open source. Um, so on Android, we're using the Android emulator. Um, there are a few sort of uh, tweaks to it that we've made, but it's the same emulator that you all know and probably hate. Um, same on iOS. It's the standard Xcode iOS simulator. Um, we're using. Um, the just sim, sim control tools in the latest Xcode versions to actually drive those. Um, before those were available, uh, there were certain open source tools, libi mobile device, stuff like that, that you could use for a similar effect. Um, yeah, and then it's just some internal tooling to sort of bring those together nicely. But like I said, it's nothing that you couldn't build at home. I hope you can understand this question. <laughs> How do you choose the devices to test for preventing being sucked into the matrix? Um, usage metrics are really important. Um, if you know that 0.01% of your users are running, I don't know, jelly bean on a rock somewhere, uh, then that's probably not worth testing. Um, Really, it's it, this is a it, it's a it's a really good question, and it sort of falls into the same bucket as don't assume that your customers are who you think they are. Don't assume that the devices are what you think they are, because you will be wrong. Because maybe sixty percent of your customers are using Jelly Bean on a rock. Um, so really, just having good metrics around what devices your code is running on is and operating systems and all that is really important for just knowing what to test on, and just as importantly, what not to test on. And Dan, since you talk really fast, you get one more. <laughs> um, why did you choose to implement your own language rather than adding a library for something like Python? So it actually is Python. Um, <laughs> they are Those are Python dictionaries. Um, and we use Python scripts to turn them into uh, non-Python. <laughs> um, but basically, it's not so much that we uh, declared our own language as much as you can sort of think of it as we declared our own schema. Um, we said, these are the elements of data that a test needs. These are the elements of data that a test can have but doesn't necessarily need. You structure that as a Python dictionary, and then we do the rest. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. <laughs>